Welcome to Healthcare IT Today. I'm John Lynn, together with my colleague and friend, Colin Hun. The world of technology and healthcare are ever-changing in new and novel ways, and that's why we love this stuff. So join us as we discuss the latest healthcare and health IT news, meshed together in new ways which help generate ideas and new perspectives. Plus, we'll have a little fun along the way. And today we'll be revisiting technologies that have kind of fallen off the radar yet are still important to healthcare. And be sure to follow the show on social media at the hashtag HITSM and our personal accounts at TechGuy and at Colin underscore Hung. Plus, check out our 18 years of health IT blog content at healthcareittoday.com. Is there any like tool that you used to use all the time that's fallen off the radar for you? Like, I mean, did you were you a pager guy or? <laughs> I, I mean, I was, I think people know that I, I was a big BlackBerry guy, right? Like, so, uh, yes, uh, you know, using that keyboard and that functionality, I don't use that anymore, but yeah, one, one that I, I used to use a lot was, um, IRC, right? uh... which, is, which was since morphed into WhatsApp and all these other things, but that kind of technology uh, dropped off for me. I was an AIM AIM guy, AIM you know, for AOL ah. Instant Messenger, and then I went to MSN Messenger, and I lived on those. Oh, man, that's going back. That's fun. <laughs> I don't remember when people used to put their IRC handles on their business cards. Like that's you know talk about being yeah being ancient. <laughs> anyway. What an evolution! So interesting. <laughs> this one should be fun, John. We're going to talk about technologies that have kind of come off the radar that are still around. So we're, by no means are we saying these technologies are, are garbage or, you know, that, are, that shouldn't be implemented or anything like that. But they've just, they've been eclipsed by hotter things and other issues that have come in, come in healthcare. I was going to so. say we're distracted by AI and the breaches and workforce. <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah. So in some ways, this is a nice break. So we're not talking about those things, which we are talking a lot about right now and talking about some things that, we haven't spoken about it in a while. And first up, John, number one on the list, I think of everyone, telehealth, right? Wasn't that long ago we were talking that telehealth was the hot technology. It was going to solve all our access issues and reduce costs in healthcare, which it has, but we haven't really heard a lot about telehealth in the last uh, 12 months. So where do you stand? Where do you, where are you seeing telehealth right now? You know, it's interesting because I actually see it more in my personal life than I did, you know, even three years ago, maybe, and more options and considering it uh, in ways that we wouldn't have before. So, you know, it's interesting that perspective. But when you look at the stock market prices of every telehealth company, it's just fallen off the map. Uh, I mean, it's granted, it's still a billion dollar, you know, there's still billion dollar telehealth companies out there. But compared to the 20 billion or whatever they were, you know, that's it's it's a big evolution. So I think the other part is that, you know, I, I think some of us realize that telehealth could work for certain things, but we also realize we do like to see the person. And and that's particularly true, I think, for the senior population who, who you know, uh, they can get by with telehealth and they needed to, right? And, and sometimes it's nicer than traveling in. But for many people, especially seniors, that's kind of their social circle is going to the doctor. So they don't mind it so much. Whereas, you know, maybe a, a mother of three children that doesn't want to drag the three children in definitely wants telehealth. So I think we're maybe seeing this evolution. And then the other question is, are the hospitals, health systems practices going to offer telehealth as an option? But we've seen some people, I mean, I went to a an OBGYN visit and the guy's like, you don't need to come back in, just hop on telehealth. And I literally asked him, I was like, oh, that's cool that you offer that. He's like, you know, do you like it? He said, well, it's not as convenient for me, but I know it's great for the patient. So I want to do it for them. I think for me, you know, I think telehealth has slowly become part of the furniture and that's probably why we're not talking about it anymore. It's I, to your point, John, I think people have realized where it does work well and they're just using it. And it's not, it's no big deal anymore. Right. Um, meaning they've incorporated it into work, into the workflow for, so for example, in some of the, uh, very specialized specialties, behavior, health, uh, nutrition, uh, where it was hard to get access in a remote location. I think telehealth has been a godsend. It's been a savior there. And I think people have become accepting of that, but for common stuff, like if you're seeing your family physician or, it, you know, that kind of thing, I, I don't think telehealth took off the way we thought it was. So there's that side. And then the other side, I think as well, 
I've always had a little bit of, of scratch my head with this market because EHR, as I thought, were eventually going to just either come up with it or OEM somebody or buy somebody and just offer this as part of the EHR. It was not going to be a separate standalone thing. Mm. And I think that's what's happened is it's been baked in now to a lot of you know, incumbent systems and they're just using whatever comes with it now. Uh, and so we've that's why we may have seen some consolidation in this market and fewer players. And that's probably why we haven't heard from as many anymore. I mean, it wasn't that long ago we were talking about Teladoc, which is still a large, large company in this space, probably the biggest in this space. And they're still doing okay, still have some good products out there. But I, I think their market has been eroded a little bit with some of the EHRs getting into and offering their own telehealth, um, telehealth offerings. Yeah, you're right. Although it doesn't really replace what Teladoc and Amwell do. I think the, you know, those are kind of the enterprise suites that if you're a large health system, you need something like that that can do all of your telehealth needs, your virtual rounding, your RPM, your <laughs> which we're going to get to that topic later. But you know, you need something that's a little more enterprise. You don't want these onesie twosie solutions. So I you know, I think that's why Teladoc and Amwell will still do well. But you're right, you know, when you look at like doxy.me that offered basically free telehealth to try it. And then there's like, you know, premium service if you want. You know, I think a lot of practices just adopted that. EHR vendors integrated solutions like it, backline as well from Dr. First. You you know, I think they want to integrate that in and they can even white label it if they want, you know, in a lot of those, a lot of these video solutions, uh, you know, we even see it with ECW's Hilo. Hilo can be integrated into a lot of systems and it spans, you know, kind of a number of the topics we're talking about today. The other one that was interesting for me is you look at someone like ZocDoc, right? Like, yeah, the fact that they're offering essentially free telehealth in this digital front door now fascinating to watch and how will that evolve and will that increase the adoption rate i think it will but we'll see yeah i mean i i think this is one of those things where we may not be talking about the companies as much but the technology is still going to be there it's an important it has become part of the fabric of healthcare which i think is a good sign and uh you know but it's it's not the be all end all savior and I think realistic, if you ask people who are in this space, I don't think they ever thought that it was going to be, but they just rode the wave, right? And um, and you know now it's just now it's just part of of the day to day operations, which I think a lot of people are still thankful that those options exist, like like your visit, for example. Yeah. Well, and we'll see what happens with reimbursement. That is going to be the key. Some licensing stuff that, you know, I know the ATA is, you know, worked on as well. If we can address those two things, I think we'd see more more telehealth as well. Well, let's go to the next one. And you kind of mentioned it in your response there, John, remote patient monitoring. Again, uh, something that was super hot, talked about a lot in the last couple of years, uh, but in the last 12 months, not so much. What's happening in your mind in RP with RPM? Yeah, this is a hard space for me to understand. And, and maybe that's what hospitals and health systems are feeling like we should be doing something, but what should we do? And there's an explosion of devices. You can get every blood pressure cuff, you know, <laughs> I literally have, you know, this awesome ring right here that, you know, that from a uh, con, you know, that I saw at CES that I'm planning to try out ring con, you know, and, and you know, we, we have the aura ring, we have, you know, even the videos doing it right. Neurologics is doing, you know, the monitoring. So we've seen this explosion of devices, but I think what's been lacking is maybe connecting all of that data to an actual patient outcome. And, and I don't know that that's kind of my theory when I, I kind of look at it, it's like, you know, cause we're getting better data. Right. I mean, smart meter has been doing some incredible things, even literally using the cell phone signal. So it's exactly the way you'd want it that you send that, you know, device to mom and dad or whoever needs it and they use it and the data is already in the cloud. Right. So, you know, I don't know though why it hasn't taken off. Yeah. I, I you know, my answer to that, John, is as you've taught me, is follow the money, right? There's just not a <laughs> lot of money going around in this space anymore. I mean, it was it was a necessity during COVID. And I think that's what kind of kickstarted the industry, which I think everyone is thankful for. But now that that crisis is over, I think people are struggling a little bit to find where RPM fits in, like where, where it can truly make a difference for the patient and where the technology is simple enough that they're not always on the call or on the phone with tech support. 
right? Because that I think that became the Achilles heel was the logistics of managing all these remote devices that you gave to a patient and then getting it to work with linking it to their Wi-Fi or, can, you know, making sure that the cell phone signal was there. So, you know, what what has been an interesting development that we also have not talked about is the rise of the companies that are now outsourcing all of that for healthcare organizations, right? So they handle all the shipping and all that stuff with the patient and they have the 1-800 number that they can, they can call to get help to connect it. And, and then, you know, just the, all that the hospital needs is just to get that feed of data. But, but yeah, you're right. We haven't talked about, you know, Mitonomy, Remedy, MedM, Chi2, like these companies that were, were sort of talk of the town for a little bit there. We just haven't spoken to them a lot re recently or spoken about them a lot. Because I think they just got their heads down trying to figure out the answers to the questions we're asking. Well, I mean, and you look what happened when Teladoc acquired Livongo. Like, uh, to be fair, I don't think they understood the Livongo business model and didn't execute it. And I don't know what Livongo's business model was either. It never made sense to me either. <laughs> but, you know, I think there are pockets of innovation, right? You know what? You, know, you mentioned Remedy, I, I saw, and I think they are making an impact for good. You know, Cure for Use in the space. We've talked to Carrium many times on Healthcare IT Today and, and the impact that they're having. But I think it's maybe that's the issue. It's it's a slice of impact. It's not like a sea change for the entire industry. It's more of very specific workflows that are having, you know, I mean, tremendous impact on those people that are within the workflow. But it hasn't been something that's like, you know, like ambient clinical voice or, you know, some AI solution that can be applied to everything. It applies to very narrow situations. And so that maybe that's why we don't hear about it as much. I, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, I, th I think that may be right. Maybe maybe there was too much hype. We expected a sea change with it, and it ended up being a nice add-on, not a complete change of how we do things. I do think, you know, obviously it, it is helping some people recover at home a little bit better and in certain use cases like that. Um, and as to your point, John, it's, it's not like there's no innovation happening. There's some pretty innovative things happening. You mentioned Remedy, of course. Uh, you know, at the recent Vive conference, I saw uh, TomBot, which makes a remote patient monitoring emotional support animal. <laughs> uh, it's a robotic uh, It's a robotic dog that basically monitors your vitals uh, and also responds to you and is an emotional support animal too. So, you know, that's pretty innovative and, and checks off a lot of boxes. And there's a lot of those kinds of things happening. And of course, the big player in this space, potentially Best Buy Health, right? Big, mm -hmm. big organization has the, all of the necessary infrastructure to support uh, RPM. And it'll be, I'm always interested to see how they're approaching the market because they're, they're making a serious go of it. Yeah, it's interesting too. Uh, we've been playing around with LEQ, which is I think from Intuition Robotics, if I remember right. But anyway, it's a, it's a senior one. And you engage your senior. I sent it to my father-in-law who's uh, 86. I don't think he minds me sharing. <laughs> but anyway, very non-technical, right? But you know, he actually gets this like kind of glee when he uses it, and when he you know does a video call to me or something, right? And the engagements you know increase. We'll see. It's still early, but there are some pockets of that where it's interesting, right? Even <laughs> if funny little anecdotal story, he needed to go pick up a picture. We'd printed a picture of the family, and he wanted to pick it up from the Walgreens, and I said. So I sent him a message on LEQ. I said, Hey, you forgot to pick up the picture <laughs> and he went and picked it up. Yeah. But it was like, anyway, just a small little things that, you know, again, that goes to more of the loneliness and stuff for seniors, you know, he feels more connected, which is awesome. Well, I, I hope I'm glad that's worked out and I hope that some of these other innovations will come to market as well. Cause, uh, I think, and I think that's where it's headed is it's going to be baked into a lot of things that we normally use, right? Like you mentioned the cell phone. I, I see it more baked into the homes we actually use. I think that's the future of remote patient monitoring rather than an actual device. The car. <laughs> oh, there you go, right into your car. And hey, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Healthcare IT Today with John Lin and Colin Hung. Today, we are discussing digital health technologies that were once super hot, but have now fallen off the radar, but are no less important. We've always we've already covered telehealth and remote patient monitoring. So next one, John, secure messaging. <laughs> 
this one's really interesting to me. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I was a, a part owner of a company that did this. So I lived this for years and seen, and it was hot, right? Like everyone was like, well, yeah, why can't we? And, and the, the view I think was get rid of the pager, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Can we do that? I think we're almost there in most places. There's a few pockets of pagers left, right? But, uh, you know, it is a better modality. You know, it's funny. I actually look back on this and I, I think about when I lived in Europe as a 19 year old, 20 year old kid, and they were using text like crazy. And you could see it. It was part of the culture of youth. It was, you know, part of the the reality of how they engage. And that hadn't hit the U.S. yet at that time, which makes me old, but that's a different issue. So <laughs> anyway, and then I came to the U.S. and I realized yeah, you know, then it finally came and, you know, we've obviously adopted it just as much. And it was just fascinating. I think we see the same in hospitals and health systems. It took longer for some to kind of adopt it and really accept like, hey, secure text messaging is a better form of communication within the four walls of the hospital and with patients. It's, but now it's just like, well, yeah, of course we're going to do that. Right. You know, like I remember talking to Volt, which has been acquired by Hill Rom and, you know, <laughs> anyway, it, you know, it's things, but I remember them telling me that they'd created a culture in these hospitals and health systems where they said, well, can we vault it? You know, which is literally saying like, can we put all the messaging from, you know, alerts, et cetera, onto vault. And, and so maybe we've just like incorporated it now you know, I don't think we say, hey, does your cell phone have text anymore? <laughs> it's like, yeah, every hospital and health system has a text solution now. Yeah, no, and I, I, I think you're exactly right on this one. I think this is one where um, it, it's completed the evolution in my mind mm. in the sense that it's now just baked in, right? Like it, it just, it's just an accepted part of doing business as a healthcare organization. You have to have secure messaging both inside the walls, as you said, and, and externally to patients. So even though we don't talk about companies like Spoke, right, which which is still in the pager business a little bit, um, but or Tiger Connect or, uh, or other companies, um, like the Canadian one I was going to mention was Hypercare, right? They, they're in the secure messaging uh, space up here in Canada. Even though we don't talk about them overtly, they're just part of the operations. And that's probably why they're just humming along, right? They provide exactly what you expect them to do. They're maybe branching out a little bit into doing alerts and some other things, maybe becoming more of a messaging infrastructure as opposed to just secure messaging between patients. But yeah, I, I just think we're not talking about it because everyone's just using it. It's not a big deal anymore. It, yeah. The other one interesting is like Vocera being acquired by Stryker. Like, why was Stryker interested in it? But, you know, it makes sense. You have the attention of the doctors and nurses that are doing it. So, you know, we'll see. I haven't really seen how that's evolved within Stryker and what they've done. You know, Perfect serves another example where they rolled up multiple uh, message companies, you know, to put together, you know, click softs in the space. You know, there, there's a bunch of them that are still doing good work and each one's taking kind of a different approach. You know, Vocera has the badge, you know, whereas Clicksoft can also do telehealth and video, right? The only place that I, I would, you know, kind of disagree with what you're saying is I'm not sure people have embraced texting the patient yet. I think that one is still evolving, you know, like I think, you know, some are and, and some are through the portal, which, you know, that's different than texting, but, you know, like, you know, like, so I think messaging patients, they've accepted to a certain degree, but I'm not sure texting with patients, even through a secure text platform, I don't think that's taken off the way we thought it would. No, and I, and I, you're 100% right. The texting with patients and any communications with the patients is still an area of growth, which is why I think these companies are still doing well, right? Because not every hospital has has um, has adopted that. You know, I, I don't know why, because it is a much better form, and most patients want it. Um, you know, and, and I know in the past it was maybe some HIPAA confusion. I think we're well past that now, or at least I hope we are. But but yeah, it it needs to get there, and I think that's where that is an area where I think there's continued growth here, which. I think is is good for the companies that are still playing in this space. Um, it'll be interesting because I also think that just in terms of social use, right? It, you know, end, end user use, we're seeing the rise of voice texts, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is basically recorded voice messages that you then play in the text, right? That comes as a text. You hit play, and it plays the message to you. Which is I don't understand that that's any different than a voicemail, but people <laughs> tell me it is. 
but but it's you know will, will it's be, better. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's new right what are, what's old is new again but but you know these are how are these going to be incorporated into the technologies I, I i think texting is evolving still and so there is a lot of uh, innovation still happening in this space yeah well and it, it yeah th now that, that we have a, a different issue i think that probably most healthcare organizations face which is they have multiple texting platforms or they acquire a bunch, you know, some hospitals, health systems, whatever. And, uh, and now they have multiple platforms. That's what I haven't, I don't understand why the big players didn't come together and say, Hey, let's do cross, you know, secure messaging across multiple platforms and let's create a standard and let's share, uh, you know, cause now the, it's kind of cemented, you know, that the, the, they're part of it. Right. And why they didn't allow for that and, and kind of embrace that and create a, for lack of a better term, an email for secure texting in healthcare, uh, you know, they, they should have, and I mean, they still can. So, you know, it would be great for them to do that. Well, in fact, you know, the company, our, our Terra Health, formerly Well Health, is trying to do exactly this. And before them, HealthGrid tried to do this, right? It's creating a single solitary, a single platform that could handle all of the, the texting needs in a standardized way. So uh, you're right. I mean, again, these are interesting things that are happening with this industry. So even though it's become part of the furniture, as I said before, you know, there's still innovation happening here. And I think that's sort of a theme that's going through uh, some of the uh, technologies that we're talking about today. But there is the next one that has not become well accepted in healthcare yet, therefore lots of opportunity, but maybe, maybe a missed boat as well. And that is RTLS for people and for assets inside the four walls of a campus or the four walls of a hospital. John, what, what, what's your take on RTLS? Yeah, you know, when I look at RTLS, it's kind of like, why don't we drive a Ferrari? And that's because we can't all afford it, right? Because it's it's a really nice car, and uh, we we you know a lot of us would like it. You know, choose choose your choose your favorite luxury vehicle. But you know, we'll use Ferrari because you know I'm going to Him Europe soon, so I gotta you know sit with Italy. But anyway, like you know, it's a, you know not everyone can drive a Ferrari because they couldn't afford it, afford it. And I think that's how people looked at RTLS in the past, right? Is they're like, wow, that would be cool to have. And I could splurge on that, but no, that's not a good idea for me to do that. And and what I think most people in healthcare haven't realized, and you know, I, I really learned this from Cognosis and, and kind of how much the cost has come down uh, on RTLS and being able to implement it. Before you used to have to do this infrastructure and you had to incorporate a bunch of teams at the hospital that you know, we're hard to get to do it. You had to do physical facilities and they're like, why are you doing this? And yeah, I mean, it was, it was kind of a mess and now it's just a lot simpler and it's a lot less expensive, right? They, they made the Ferrari affordable for everyone, if you will. And, and so I think that's, you know, so I'm hopeful that it will still have its breakout moment, uh, you know, and be able to do it because there are some potential and, you know, there's also an evolution. We've talked about the, uh, maybe on a previous episode that RTLS isn't, Hey, where are my three devices? It's, <laughs> Hey, how many devices do I need so that I just make sure they're in the right place at the right time? Or how much supplies do I need? So I make sure we refill them before it even becomes an issue. So it's been a change of mindset, you know, for many people. And I think many hospitals looked at it and said, this is for the rich and I can't afford it. Yeah, I can't argue with you there. I also think there was very specialized use, right? I think it was mm -hmm. mostly for clinical engineering, right? To track assets and, and things. It was maybe for procurement to kind of know, hey, like, do we have a lot of equipment we're just not using and therefore we don't need to replenish or we can get rid of the, the you know, the service contracts on them. That was sort of the first few use cases of RTLS. Uh, but that was very specialized to very specific departments. But over time, I look at RTLS and go, well, there's a lot of other use cases that have emerged um, during the pandemic. RTLS systems, you know, could help with contact tracing. Uh, it could also help with just safety and knowing where your people are, right? Security is starting to get to find very, in, uh, very significant use cases for RTLS. And then now with the size of the trackers, you can get now even RTLS on much smaller devices than before. They don't have to be bed sized, right? Or or a, or a cow, right? Like they can be a single a unit, uh, a package of 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 something, a sterile package or something like that can be tracked now, uh, at a much better level. And you're right. No longer do I need specialized hardware. I can use the existing infrastructure a lot of times in the hospital, right? You know, companies like Gozio. Uh, 
Contact IO, Sendtrack, they all make these RTLS systems that can do all of these things. And it's that kind of value now that I think they're pitching. And, and hopefully they will have that moment. And we're even seeing companies like our friends over at Esri getting into this space, right? They've traditionally done RTLS or GIS in the external environment. Now they're bringing that technology inside the four walls of buildings uh, and they're getting into the RTLS game. So I, I think there's some growth here. I just, you're right. I still think there there has to be a little bit of a reframe because I, I still believe people think it's a luxury item, not a must have. Yeah. And, well, and I think it is interesting to see the evolution, you know, that now it could be, you know, more of an opportunity. And, you know, as cost pressures come, that's one place to lower your costs if you do it effectively. But I also look at like other companies like HID Global that are in, well, you know, a lot of other industries, not just healthcare. And I wonder how many in this space who are in a lot of industries, which is a common thing in this space, you know, are saying, well, it's easier somewhere else. <laughs> you know, healthcare is a lot harder to do. And so then they kind of give up on it a bit, you know, they have a few customers or whatever, but it's not their focus because it's easier to grow in another space. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's interesting to watch, you know, I, RTLS is, a, I mean, it, there's so much data there that could help healthcare and you'd think that it would be a common thing, but it, you know, it, it, you know, the, certainly any new hospital has some of it built in. So that, I don't know if that's an indicator of the future, but you know, it, it, yeah, but it really hasn't exploded the way we thought. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th this is one of those ones where you, you scratch your head and go, did it miss its moment or is this moment yet to come? It'll be fun to watch that over the next little while. Well, and the interesting thing, looking at all four of these kind of in, in whole, like there are big companies in all of these spaces <laughs> that are really successful, that are making an impact, uh, you know, secure text message is part of the daily routine of, of most healthcare workers, right? Especially nurses, doctors, they're, they're using it constantly. So it, it's interesting that it is part, you know, many of these things are part of the daily infrastructure of healthcare, uh, you know, but because it's kind of like you said, built into the furniture, we don't talk about it as much anymore because it's like, well, yeah, of course we're doing it. <laughs> and, I, and I think a related, you know, I think the hype maybe have, may have outpaced its reality. And mm. so there's a, maybe a unwarranted disappointment that it didn't live up to that overhype, right? But but we're, what we're seeing is actually the benefits of where it should be, right? We're now seeing the realistic benefits and, and they're significant still, as, as you've said, there are some very large companies and they're not, it's not fluff, right? They're providing real value to these organizations. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode, John. Another one in the can. That was fun. Uh, people should go uh, like and comment, uh, you know, and s tell us what other ones, what other topics do they think are not getting enough attention? I'd love to hear that. <laughs> I think that's a great, that'd be another on great ongoing recurring episode that we should do. Yep. Hey, thanks to all of you who tuned into this episode of Healthcare IT Today. You can find more details about our show by checking out the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com. And please share your voice and engage with the community at healthcareittoday.com and on social media using the hashtag HITSM. I'm Colin Hung with my friend and health IT collaborator, John Lee. Thanks for listening and have a great week.